this, Jim has received numerous awards from uh, national organizations such as the U.S. Small Business Administration. The American Chamber of Commerce executives have presented Jim with a coveted and rare Champion of Chambers Award. He is an admitted obnoxious grandfather for 18 years and counting. And he has this new wonderful beard <laughs> that I think is absolutely charming. He looks, he was saying that he looks more like Hemingway than Santa Claus, but he surely fulfills Grandpa. And uh, so I present Jim to you. He's going to analyze the world in the internet for us. Thank you. There we go. Actually, I really did push the button. <laughs> anyway, so I'm glad you're here. And uh, I, I was telling you about Jan and, and Bob. They've been dear friends of ours. We've just been amazed at their leadership wherever they go. It's just uh, they always give, 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 and, and, and show people how to do it the right way. And so we're sorry Bob's not here tonight, but, but thank you, Jan, for that. OK, let's go to work. What do you think? Are you ready to have some fun? Yeah. Maybe, maybe learn a couple of things? <clears throat> I'm going to tell you some things tonight that you already know. I'm going to tell you some things you're going to say, hmm, I already knew that, but thank you for reminding me. And I'm going to tell you some things tonight that you didn't know. I'm almost certain. And if you, and if you have, and I say you haven't, you can correct me later. <clears throat> so let's talk, about, uh, let's talk about civility. Let's talk about our journey of civility into the, in the, in the digital age. Tonight, you're going to hear me use these three words quite a bit. You're going to hear me talk about analog. You're going to hear me talk about leverage. You're going to hear me talk about digital. Uh, Chris Bishop, can you read code? You can read code, can't you? Chris, my buddy Chris Bishop, you can read code, can't you? What does that say? Not HTML, code. Can you read, can you read digital? That's, that spells civ uh, civil, civility. So. I love this, proverb, this ancient proverb, it's easier to get where you're going if you know where you've been, right? Where we've been for 10,000 years is what I call the analog age. It began with the Neolithic when people started uh, husbanding animals and, and growing crops and, and uh, that was about 10,000 years ago. I actually mark it for my own purposes, I actually, my own non-scientific purposes, purely literary purposes, uh, I actually marked it at 8102 B.C. About 10,000 years ago, the analog age began, and we're, and we're still in the analog age, but, we, there, but it's not the only age that we're in. So in, in the analog age, everything was physical. Everything was chemical, including us, right? Every one of us, every human ever born, always will be, always have been analog. And... Along the way, everything we created was analog, including all this stuff, right? Look at all this stuff, all this analog stuff. I, obviously, I couldn't get it all in, on one slide, but you recognize that. How do you like the 57 Chevy? Yeah, did, <laughs> I know some of you <laughs> recognize that. So that was all, all analog stuff, including that beautiful thing in the middle there. That's an analog thing, isn't it? So leverage. In order to create all that stuff, we created leverage in the analog age. And uh, lots of different kinds of leverage, right? Along the way, we had to create something else. In order to maintain civility and in order to create order, we had to create something else. We had to create something called ethics. And if you're in the analog age, what kind of ethics would it be? 
Say it all, say it all together. Analog ethic. Exactly. Well done. Give yourself a hand. Well, well done. <laughs> so, analog ethics. And, and apparently, I've coined that term. Didn't know it. It wasn't intending to. But I, was, I got a phone call one day after a, a, a futurist friend of mine knew, my, knew about my work. I'd sent him some stuff and when I was developing the book. And he said, do you realize that you've coined the term analog ethics? I said, no. How do you know that? He said, well, I googled it on ethics and your article is the only one that's ever been where it's ever shown up before. Now, think of the, what are the chances of that? I mean, if some, if I'm my, when I'm, I'm on my deathbed, my grandson says, says, Poppy, what is your greatest accomplishment? I actually coined something that Google had never heard of. <laughs> Who's, who can do that, right? So uh, he said, and he's going to say, I thought you said it was, was going to say it was me. Anyway, analog ethics. Analog ethics. Had you ever thought about analog ethics? You thought about ethics, right? But probably not analog ethics. So what's your definition of ethics? Somebody give me the definition of ethics. What's an example? Anybody? Not everybody at once. Doing the right thing. Say again, louder. The right thing. What's your name? Alan. Alan. Do the right thing. Give Alan a hand. Isn't that great? Yeah. Uh, he told me and I forgot. So what else? Other, and I won't, I won't make them give you a hand if you don't want. Uh, who else has got, got a definition of ethics? Appropriate behavior. Very well. Very well. Code of conduct, those are all good. What else? Hey there. How you doing, Sarah? Keeping your promises. What else? This is great. Yes, sir? Going up to, but not crossing the line. I love that. And, that, and I'm going to stop because that's perfect for my next slide. Because it came from my friend, Lynn Morella, who wrote this outstanding book, in Search of Ethics, he's a member of my brain trust. By the way, the, my brain trust are the people who are on my show with me every, every, uh, every day. Four interviews a day, thousand a year, live interviews since 1997. I get to meet uh, uh, amazing people like Sarah Heiner and, and Matt Amore and, and Bishop and, and Ruth uh, Sherman and, and lots of other, other folks that are here tonight, and including Lynn Morella. Read that. Ethics is devotion to the unenforceable. Is that beautiful? Isn't that what you said, sir? What's your name? Lester. Lester. That's my grandfather's name. I love that name. One. There you go. He was smart too. Isn't that what you just said? Right up, up to, but not beyond the line. Isn't not, not cross it. Devotion to the owner. Because you could have crossed that line. Nobody was there to stop you, right? That's what ethics is. Devotion to the unenforceable. I love that. Write that down. That's going to be on the test. Okay, so I want, you to, I want you to tell me some words that define trust. Not, not sentences. I want a word that defines trust. Somebody... I mean ethics. What would it be? I gave one of them away. What defines, what's a word that defines ethics? Respect. Respect. Good for you. What else? Honesty. Honesty. Good. What else? No, one word. No, I get, yeah, that's good, though. That's good, but one word. I need one word. Um, that, that's, but that's good. What else? One word. Understanding. Understanding. That's a good one. How about these? Trust. Who said trust? Good job. So all of those things you said, some of them are in, in, my, in my electron orbit there. Some of them aren't, but they all should be. And they're all orbiting the big kahuna of, of ethics, right? Trust. Isn't trust the big one? Isn't that the one in the middle? Isn't that the one, the nucleus of everything, the foundation of everything we do? Isn't trust there? Well, these guys figured that out. That's Og on the right and Gog on the left. That's, that's 8102 B.C., and Og, the little guy, was getting beat up. He was getting the bad end of the stick. And so he find, literally, he finally dropped his, weapon, his club one day and he said, Gog, let's stop fighting. Let's get along. Why don't we just get along? And Gog said, oh, I never thought of that. He dropped his weapon. He raised his hand. Three things were born at that moment. My friends, there was a moment in time. When people dropped their weapons and three things were born, trust was born, could that have happened without trust? No way. It could not have happened. Before we knew anything about loyalty or respect or, or, or maybe even love, there was trust. 
It was there first. Second thing that was born, markets. Proto-market. That's the moment proto-market was born. I love that word, proto-market. I may have coined that one too, I'm not sure. Proto-market. Think about that. Because Og said, let's do business. Let's quit fighting. He said, they used to just beat each other up. For, and I want your stuff. <coughs> and and I'd, I'd take it. And then you'd come back in a month and get it from me and take it back. That's what, how it worked. And the third thing that was created, civility. Those three things at that moment. Trust. Trust is what we expect of each other. Values or what we expect of ourselves. We put those two together, and we created some pretty cool ideals, haven't we? You you have your own. If you know, obviously, I think the Constitution is a great ideal. There are many, many others. We talked about some earlier today. We were we were reflecting on Senator Dale O'Connor's news recently. Ideals. And what's a bigger, most more beautiful ideal than civility? Did you know, I did the research on this. Did you know that every major faith, ideology, philosophy in the history of the analog age has the golden rule somewhere in its foundation? From, from Yi Ching to, to, to the, the Upanishads to, to the Torah to, you know, all the way through. There, there they are. Something that described the concept of the golden rule, which is the foundation of civility, isn't it? So, fear and greed. We all know what fear and greed is. That's our two reptilian prime motivators, right? Always has been, always will be. And, but in the, in the analog age, with the beginning of Og and Gog, right, they started creating something with trust, creating something that I've called passive forces. That's how I describe it in the book, passive forces. Passive forces are ethics, but it's also laws, regulations, currency, insurance, things like that. The things that we've created to hold fear and greed in equilibrium. And you know what? If we hadn't done a pretty good job so far, we wouldn't be here. Would you agree with that? It hasn't been perfect. It's been a little messy at times. We broke some eggs. We, 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 we got some lemons. But we wind up doing that. We, we held... Basically, in the analog age, we held fear and greed in equilibrium, and the product of that, one of the products of that was civility. So, here's my question. Are you an ethical person? I know that you are. You know why I know you are? Because you said you'd be here tonight, and you showed up. I'm an ethical person, right? I said I would be here, and I showed up. On the way over here, you sit on your side of the road, I sit on my side of the road. Those, that's an ethical thing to do. Have you ever thought about that? Just stand on your side of the road. You know, I don't know you. You're coming at me. I'm believe, I believe I'm trusting you to stay over there, right? Think about that. But what's the issue there, though, really? We practice this every day. But do you ever wonder why we don't think about it? You ever think... Well, you don't think about that, right? You stayed on your side? Did, has anybody ever thought about that as being an ethical thing? It's an example, but we don't think about it. You know why? Because we've, we've been doing it so long. It's so much a part of our DNA, basically. It is part of the modern humans, really, of our DNA, to, be, to behave that way. And the reason is, is because we've been doing it so long. We don't think about it much. We don't talk about it. Unless ethics is the com topic of conversation, how often do it, does it actually come up? Not much, right? Because you just expect it. We've created all these things on this beautiful foundation of ethical behavior. But the truth is, and this is something that I'm pretty sure you haven't ever thought about before, ethics is not something found in a static rock wall. Ethics, analog ethics, moves at the same speed as the leverage. Raise your hand if you've ever thought about that before. Exactly. And so, I mean, I, these, these are things that, that, that I've, as I've started to work on this book, I've, I realized we've never really thought about this before. We've never really thought about, about the fact that ethics moves. It not only moves, my friends, it must 
move. Ethics must move at the speed of the leverage. Ethics and civility, therefore, must move at the speed of the leverage. So we create all this wonderful stuff on this beautiful foundation of ethics. God is in his heaven and all is right with the world. And then something happened. Something crazy happened, right? A 10 millennium, a once in 10 millennium paradigm shift. How many of you don't like the word paradigm? I love it. I love it. I'm sorry, I love it. Let me tell you why I love it. Number one, the man who, re who brought it back into our, into our consciousness about 40 years ago, uh, Joel Barker, one of the great futurists of our time. If you've ever seen the, the you read the book, uh, the, business of, the, <laughs> the Business of Paradigms, I think is, is how, he's got a, is a film out on it. It's, it's amazing. It'll change your life when you watch it. And he's a friend of mine. He's a member of my brain trust. He... If you, if you understand what a paradigm really is, it's a set of laws that we've learned how to live with and be successful. It's the filter through which we see the world. That's our paradigm. I'm not saying it's bad. Some people think it's bad. Some people think when, it, when things shift, it's because they've, got, they've gotten bad. It's just the way you see the world. You have a paradigm about a lot of things. But we had a paradigm about ethics, and then something, it shifted. Something happened that's never happened before. Digital leverage. Digital, we never had digital leverage before, 10,000 years. We never had that. That happened, and it started replacing analog leverage. What, are you, what have you done to my beautiful analog leverage? I want it back. How many of you really would like to have your old rotary phone back? <laughs> Raise your hand. Nobody? I'm the only one. Are you kidding me? <laughs> thank you. Thank you. You know what I liked about those old things? They just worked. <laughs> they always did you in, in your life with one of those phones, did they ever not work if... They always worked, right? Anyway, I, I, I digress. Digital leverage is replacing analog leverage, and it's causing a lot of anxiety, isn't it? How many of you, raise your hand, it's okay to be honest and a little embarrassed. How many of you are more anxious about technology than you've ever been in your life? I got my hand up. Whenever I asked, I ask audiences about this, it's almost 100%, it's almost instantaneous. Just about everybody is a little bit more anxious today than they were before. So why, why is there so much anxiety? Well, and, and why is there so much, such a lack of civility today? Well, I think it's because of this. The analog age is, is going away. The digital age is, is emerging, replacing it. And there's only one thing that's going to be common to both ages. And you know what that is. It's you and me. And with all, the, with all that, you and I are like the fish. The fish doesn't know he's in water, right? He doesn't know he's in a, a water medium, a, 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 a dimension of water. He doesn't know that until he jumps out, until he's out. So you and I are jumping out of that analog dimension, <laughs> and we're jumping into a new dimension, a digital dimension, and it's making us anxious. It's a little bit creepy. And it seems to be devoid of ethics. And with all the great stuff that we have, all this great technology, and let me tell you something, folks. I, went, I was on computer for the first time in 1975. I'm a high adopter. I'm not nearly as smart as Chris is. He's a rock star. But, and, and probably some of the others in the audience, I, I, I bow to you. But I've been using it a long time. I'm a high adopter. I wouldn't be standing in front of you had I not found a way to leverage digital technology for my media company. But with all that, we have to remember. Folks, this is such an important point to remember forever, not just for this moment, but for, for as long as you live. And to tell your children, your grandchildren, you're still an analog human. You're still a human being. Basically, you're, not, you're no different from... The, the human being that you are is no different from Abraham Lincoln or, or Moses or Og and Gog. We're still basically the same humans, and yet we've got all this stuff. And we assume ethical behavior, don't we? We anticipate civility, but we require trust. This is, this, is, this is at the heart of why we're anxious. 
Any, any moment, anything that happens that, that leeches away some of, your, some of your trust. And it might not even be the kind of thing that you could, you could tell. That's just what's making us a little bit, of, a little bit anxious. Because we require this, we might not be getting it all as much as we want. Here's a, here's a new word I'll introduce to you. Proximity. Notice the, inner, notice the relationship between the word leverage and the word ethics. They're connected. They're intertwined. You could almost say they're inextricable. Right? Why have I put them together like that? Because of this. Remember that? Remember that, that, that my leverage slide? Notice, notice the relationship. Notice the proximity of the hand, the literal hand, to the product of the leverage. Anybody here ever plowed behind a horse or a mule? Anybody here ever done that besides me? So, notice the proximity of, of that. Notice this proximity. Look at those hands. These are all analog age things, folks. Notice the hands on the leverage and, the, and, and, and how, how close the hand is to the product of the leverage. This is how the analog age was for all of the 10,000 years of the analog age. It is still that way to, 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 to a large degree, right? Note, notice all that. And, and so this is created... Because of, uh, of this disconnect, because today it's not like that, is it? Because of this disconnect, we're experiencing some anxiety about our ethical expectations. We expect things to be different, and they're not. We, we push a button, we push that button right there, and we expect you to go through our beautiful 10,000-year catalog of analog, of analog ethics into a nine-digit I mean, a 9 gigahertz, nitrogen-cooled, 28-core processor, and spit out a 24-carat nugget of trust. Now, we don't think about that. None of you have thought about that, and yet every one of you have done it without thinking about it. You've, you've, you've hit a button, and you, and, and you imagined that it was going to come out exactly like you wanted to on the other end, and whatever happened to it on the way was never going to be used anywhere except exactly how you want it to be used. That was a nice trip down Fantasy Lane, wasn't it? So is it, without realizing it, because we don't think about things like this, without realizing it, this is what we think is happening, and yet this is really what's happening. She pushes that little button, it goes into a Google server farm, where the algorithms live, by the way, that's where they live. Hi there, Scott. Welcome. Notice the proximity of her leverage to the product of her leverage. Notice where her finger is compared to where what she's doing is going. So here's my question to you. I want, to, I want you to talk to me for a second. Tell me what you think she's doing. What are some things that she could be doing? I'm not sure. <laughs> is that the right kind of question to answer? Sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> Online shopping, who else? Facebook? Good, good. Yeah, social media. Who, what else? Emailing. That's the next one. What else? Research. She could be beautiful research, right? What else? Making a phone call. Making a phone call. She could be doing that. She could be FaceTiming her grandmother. Why aren't you FaceTiming your, my, your grandmother, right? That's what, that's what grandmother's saying. Yeah. Transferring Trans, She could be transferring money. Lester? Designing. You're getting ahead of me, Lester. I told you. I told you Lester was smart. So yes, she's doing all those things, but she also might be developing fake news, right? Think about that. She may be trying to influence an election one way or the other, inappropriately, right? She doesn't look like a Russian, but she could be. <laughs> so, but, but we don't know what she's doing, do we? Well, what do we know? We know that that thing right there what do we call that? When we see something on the screen, what do we call that? What's the, word, what's the term we use for that? Grayed out. Haven't you heard that term? It's grayed out. You ever heard that term? If, if, if you go to click on something, if you're on a website and it looks gray like that, and you're over there, how many times, tell me the truth, how many times have you gone, <coughs> right? Surely I'm not hitting this button hard enough. It's because it doesn't exist. It's under construction. It hasn't been, if it's being built, it's not ready for prime time. Bam! 
bam, you still hit it, right? That doesn't exist right now. Not in the way you think of ethics. There are people working on digital ethics. By the way, um, for some reason, they seem to be mostly in Europe. <laughs> there, the Europeans have spent a lot of time on this, but, but I'm not sure in the right way. Uh, Scott, Scott's not his enemy. He knows. So, she may think it's going through that beautiful catalog, right? But it isn't, isn't it? It's going in all those places where she's doing whatever she wants to do. Isn't that correct? Am I right about that? Even the most, one of the most powerful analog levers we have, the 95,000 horsepower, beautiful Boeing 747, those guys, their hands are very near to all that power. And I'm a pilot. I know what goes on in a cockpit. That you can cut the ethics with a knife in a cockpit. You can cut, and you're thankful for that too because you're on that plane. You can cut the ethics with a knife in a cockpit. Can you cut the expert the ethics with with a knife with with what what's, what's behind them? Maybe, but maybe not. So we know we all know this this slide, right? What is that? What does that say? Say it louder. Garbage in, garbage out. Exactly. Well, what I'm telling you, folks, is no ethics in, no ethics out. I'm not saying. I'm not saying that somebody's doing something mean. I'm telling you, it's not being done, to a large degree, not enough. And we can be forgiven for some of this, folks, because it's taken us ten thousand years to go from mammoth to mainframe, but only a couple of generations to go from mainframe to mobile. Think about that. 10,000 years you develop a beautiful catalog of analog ethics. And we've only been doing this for a couple of generations. Let me give you another example of how to measure it. If the analog age were compressed into one hour time, the digital age would be in the last third of a second of that hour. What does that tell you? I did the math on that, by the way. So here's another one. How many of you ever read a topographical map? I know Scott has. He's a climber. Who, how many of you ever read a topographical map? In the military maybe or, or, or whatever. A topographical When you see two lines that close together, what does that tell you, Scott? Steep. Yes. Tough going. Right? Tough going. Hard climbing. Right? That's what that means. I created this slide. I, I, I just said, this, this has got to be going somewhere. And when I started connecting all these dots, I said, that's it. Look at that. From 56 to 2018, our ethics, I mean, our, our, our leverage just shot up. But our ethics is in some steep, we're in some steep climbing here. We, so we got to, that means we have to move fast. It means we have to move faster. So are you ready to become devoted to death, digital ethics? Devotion. I want you remember remember my friend Lynn Morella's word devotion. Devotion to the unenforceable. I want you to start thinking about that. I want that to be like a, a buzz a buzzword that you can't get out of your head. You'll curse me in, in the future because I, I you you thought of of of, of devotion and you said damn blasting game but put that word in my head like a bad song right? Devotion devotion to the unenforceable. When are you when are you going to be ready to become devoted to digital ethics so we can take these beautiful these beautiful that beautiful catalog and convert it into something that, that will will look like trust in a nine gig, nine gigahertz nitrogen cool thirty two core processor. Well, it's not too soon to get started. We know about digital fear and greed. Does anybody think that there is no digital fear and greed? Of course, there's a lot, right? And does anybody disagree with me when I say it's actually breached equilibrium now? There, in some ways, digital fear and greed has breached equilibrium. Anybody not agree with that? Well, why is that? Why is that happen? Because passive forces, ethics and laws and regulations and currency and insurance, those things are analog elements. They're not fast enough and not strong enough to hold digital fear and greed in equilibrium. When you, when you know about these things, you, I know you know about every one of these breaches. It's how this man makes a living. Um, I know you know about every one of those, but have you ever seen them all together? <laughs> 17, the 17 greatest 
in, the, in, in our history since 2000? How about that, folks? <laughs> well, okay, I'll, all right, I'll help you out. I, I didn't think about that. I thought you'd just trust me. Uh, <laughs> Equifax, Friend Finder, I'm teasing. Friend Finder, Anthem, eBay, uh, JP Morgan Chase, Home Depot, Yahoo, 3 billion records, 3 billion Yahoo, Target, uh, stores, I, I've reported on every one of these on my show uh, with people like Scott. Adobe, uh, the U.S., Matt, the, the government, uh, Sony, RSA, the government, uh, Heartland Payment Systems, and TJX, whatever that is, companies. Those are the 17 big ones. That's just the big ones. When you, when you heard about those things, what was your first thought? It's one of my records there, right? We all thought about that, right? But maybe without realizing it, your feeling about ethics in your life took a little bit of a hit. Probably, possibly without realizing it. And but maybe without realizing it, 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 it dented your notion of civility just a little bit. That's what this does. So we have when all, the, when all these things are circling your universe, your world, all these things, as they're, as they're all around you, do you feel, are you getting a feeling of ethics? When I call you and tell you I'm going to be here, and you call and say you'll be here, we all had a feeling of ethics. We didn't think about it, we didn't talk about it, but we showed up. This doesn't give you that same feeling, does it? I'm not picking on these guys, but we have to start talking about this now. Digital ethics. We have to start talking about it. And we have, as, we, as we do, we have to remember two things. Humans, remember, we're always going to be analog. We're the only thing that's going to penetrate the digital age that's analog and stay, and stay analog. Even the table and chairs of our great-great-grandchildren won't be, won't be analog. They'll be, they won't need them. I don't know. But they will be. They'll st until a child is born with a Bluetooth brain... They're going to be, they're going to, we're going to be analog. Humans will require trust. And here's the other thing that you probably hadn't thought about. Our ethics, our digital ethics have to move. And this is a big deal. This is where, when I talk to people, I actually talked to a futurist one time. And I was telling him about my ideas. He said, eh, you're wasting your time. It's not necessary. Your work is, your work is unimportant. It doesn't matter. I said, why do you say that? Not that it didn't hurt my feelings, but I wanted to know. And I said, why do you say that? He said, it'll work out. It always has. It'll work out. It always has. He, this is a future teaching at a college, a university. He's teaching you futures, <laughs> futurism, right? He said, it's a work out. It always has. Well, guess what? In 1985, when people were anxious about the telegraph, he was right. 1885. He was right. 2018, he's wrong. This is different, my friends. This is different. Remember the ramp? Remember the two lines together? This is different. Please believe me if you never believe anything else I say. We must, it must move at the speed of the, of the leverage. And this is something that not only is different, but we haven't had to deal with before. So who's going to create digital? Who's going to make that a beautiful, hot? That's the, other, that's the, that's the opposite of grayed out is hot. Right? Who's going who's gonna to make that hot? Filled with terabytes. What's, what's more than terabytes, Scott? Exobyte? Petabyte. Okay, that's enough. <laughs> that's enough. <laughs> petabytes. A zillion petabytes, which is probably something else. Second? Zettabyte. There you go. All right. So who's going to create a, a, a thousand zettabytes? A beautiful digital truck. Who's going to do that? You know what? Who's going to do it? Well, let me ask you this. Well, who's going to, who's going to be, who's going to be uh, devoted to civility? There's that digital word again. Who's going to be devoted to civility? Well, we can't outsource it. I am the biggest champion of outsourcing of anybody you've ever known. And you know why? Because I think that's what's made Main Street. What's made Main Street is outsourcing. You know why? Because we're no, small businesses are no, no longer mom and pops. Backwater mom and pops. We're now we're now vertically integrated partners with corporate America. 
You're looking at a person who has been and is a vertically integrated partner with corporate America. So I'm the great, because they outsource that stuff to me. They outsource that. How many of you here have businesses? I know two guys have, have, have outsourced. Yes. Your, your business is a, is a, that's your model. It's your business model. I'm a major champion of outsourcing, but not with this. We can't outsource. We can't let somebody else do it all by themselves. I love, have you ever heard of, of Kathy O'Neill? She wrote a book called Weapons of Math Destruction. It's a great book. She's a quant. You know what, everybody knows what quant is, right? These really smart mathematicians. And, and so she was a quant. And of course, her parents were so proud of her. She finally realized that we're not doing things right here. <laughs> she quit being a quant and wrote this book called Weapons of Math Destruction. And she says, for all the things that they're capable of that are beautiful and wonderful, they have a problem. They struggle mightily, she said, with concepts. What are ethics if not a concept? What is civility if not a concept? So can we count on computers? Are the computers going to do it? Remember what we say, ethics, no ethics in, no ethics out, right? How about Wall Street? Are we going to count on those guys? Look at that. This is an actual Wall Street Journal headline and part of the copy. That's right out of the, right out of the paper. These firms hope to use analytics to gain an advantage over mere humans. Does that sound like an ethical statement to you? It doesn't to me. Now, now do you think those, those people are bad guys? They're probably not. They're probably your children. Some of them. No, I mean, they're not bad people. They just don't know any better. We have to help them. How about these guys? Does anybody... I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand because if you do, if you, if you do, I don't want to know it. <laughs> does, does any, I'm going to say it and just rhetorically. Does anybody believe that, the, that politicians can solve our, our digital ethics issues? I don't. Either, either side of the aisle. So uh, I don't mean to pick on Google, but that's their mission. Is there anything that sounds ethical about that mission? Is, is it a bad mission statement? No. It's a perfectly fine business mission statement. But does it sound like something that makes you think they're thinking about what we're talking about today? I don't think it does. I'd like to change that. I'm not picking on jo uh, Mr. Zuckerberg, but how many of you heard him speak before, before uh, Congress and, and in Europe? Yeah, several of you did. I don't know what you got out of it, but here's what I got out of it. We actually, I'm, I'm knitting all this out, and I might, I might be taking a little bit of license, but not much. We actually don't, at Facebook, we actually don't know how to manage our own ethics. We don't even think our customers, our users, can do it. So we're probably going to have to have you regulate us before long. That's kind of, that's what I heard. I might be stretching a little bit, but I didn't hear him have any ethical Analog, uh, digital ethics, silver bullets. Did you guys? I didn't hear that. So, how about this headline? The vast majority of all these employees give more money to the Republicans than the Democrats. Does that frighten any of you? But before you said that, who said that? I do the jokes here. <laughs> now, before he said that, some of you, I can see the sweat popping out of your forehead. Of course, you wouldn't like that, but who likes that? I don't want them, I don't want them devoted to any political ideology. Do you? The people who are in charge of your ethics, the people who are creating your digital leverage, who we need to help them understand what we expect, what our expectations are for digital ethics... Apparently, they're focused on one. If, that, if, the, if what I showed you first were the truth, it would upset me. And it should upset you. How about, how about Mr. Bezos? This is an actual quote from Wall Street Journal, the first one. Actual quote from Wall Street Journal. He said, do whatever it takes and don't worry about the cost. Now, just, now remember those words that I pulled out of those mission statements? Remember what I talked, we talked about, the, 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 I'm sorry, the, uh, not the mission, but the, the graph, the uh, examples of trust and, and all that. Does any of that sound, does any of that sound like ethical words? 
or civil. Does that sound civil to you? That little quote in the bottom, I have a friend, and out of her own mouth at, at our party that we had, some of you attended in New, in New York City to launch the book, out of her own mouth at our party, she told me, she asked Jeff Bezos face to face that question, and he said this to her. I don't care about books or bookstores. I just want to sell people everything they need and collect their information in the process. Does that sound like an ethical response to you? Now, now maybe he, I, I'm not impugning his ethics. I don't know how ethical he is. I just know that that doesn't sound like it. And there are two, so far he's 0 for 2 with me. Okay? And I didn't have to hunt for that. I didn't have to go hunting for that. I found it. All right, so here's those words I, I got ahead of myself. I, went, I actually went and found some, some mission statements. <clears throat> and I pulled, now these aren't tech companies. They make things. They sell things. They, they help people, services and goods and stuff like that. I'm not going to tell you who they are. It's not important. But about seven of them, I went and found, and I, found, I just found seven. And out of their mission statements, I pulled these words. Optimism, inspire, healthier, no harm, most respected, socially conscious, create a better life. Those actual words or phrases were in their mission statement. My friends, these are the kinds of things. If you want to know what you can do to help people, to, to, to promote digital ethics, you can require these companies, we can require these companies, all of them, to state their values and then demonstrate those values in the form of digital ethics in their technology. If you don't, I'm not investing in your company, nor am I going to buy your products. We can do that. Now, I know that probably sounds a little Pollyannish. It might sound like I'm a little naive, a little romantic, and I'm guilty as charged. But if we don't try, it ain't going to happen. And these guys aren't going to wait around on us. And how many of you, and see, AI, AI is coming down market. Who, did I talk, who was I talking to earlier today about AI? Yes, but somebody, you, but somebody else. Was, there was somebody actually was talking about a, uh, something that they were working on that was, uh, uh, anyway, it was Chris, ours, but it, well, there was another, another conversation. Anyway, it's coming down market. How many of you have, own a business? You'll be using AI in your, in your career. So what I'm telling you is, I, I'm, I, want us to, I want us to do this so well that your customers expect of you what I just said to expect of these other people. And this is what I'm calling the, aid, the digital age success equation. Your company's stated values times your company's demonstrated digital ethics equal profits and, and, and sustainability. I think you're going to have to, in your careers, you're going to have to do this. It's going to happen. So well, let me ask you a question. If you didn't have analog ethics in your, in your career, in your business, if you weren't operating your businesses with analog ethics, would you be able to stay in business? Nobody would come and do business with you, would they? They, they expect you to do that. Well, they're going to start expecting you to do that with your digital, too. All right. Here are the champions. These are the people who are going to, who are going to create digital ethics, you and me. We've been, but the problem is we took 10,000 years to do it first. Now we don't have much time to do it now. So are you ready to take on this new, this new ethical dimension? Uh, I asked you if you were an ethical person. How, if I asked you if you were a digitally ethical person, what would you say? Are, you think you are? Okay, you are, all right. I'm glad to hear you say that out loud. I have it on record. We got, we're recording it. I have it on record. So let's, let's take a look at that. And it's a little two minute, a little two act vignette, not two minutes, don't worry. It's a little two act vignette that uh, I, want, I want to tell you about. It's a, it's a story that I want to tell you that's called, What's More Dangerous Than an Algorithm or a Robot? So you are at your favorite El Fresco Cafe, and you're having a, you're having a cappuccino. And you've got your, your smartphone in front of you, and you are reading the news, and things are popping up, and, and somebody sent you something, and you clicked on it, and they were telling you about the awesomest app, the sexiest app you've ever seen in your life, and you thought, I must have this. I've got to have this on my smartphone. And you go, and just about right there, somebody walks up, right up to you. Pardon me, Michael. Here's Michael. Somebody told me it was Michael. Michael, um, you know 
You know Chris Bishop. And I've been told that you know Chris Bishop. I need to speak to Chris. I need to contact him. And I'd like for you to give me his contact information. Now, Chris is your major contact in the whole world. Your most important contact in the whole world. This is Act 1 now. And you say what? Freeze frame. What's he going to say? Is he going to, say, is he going to give him the contact information? He think, think not? How many think, think he will? What are you going to do, Michael? You're not going to give it to him. But why? Why would you not help this person out? That would be unethical, wouldn't it? Chris, do you think he's going to give you your contact information? No, because you expect ethics of him, right? So what, what happened then? He passed the analog ethics test. We've had 10,000 years to get ready for this, my friends. Okay? So now, you say to that person, Michael, I'm sorry, I can't help you. I'm not going to help you, dude. I don't even know who you are. I've got stuff to do. And he walks away, and you proceed to hit the button. Pow! Whereupon your phone is now completely infected by this app. It's not really infected. It's, it's in there. You're happy, right? But there's a little piece of the story that's missing. This language was part of that app. And it was so prominent, they actually put it up like that on the phone. You know why, you know why I'm telling you this? Because that, actu that actual language, that, those very words were on the video recording editing software on my phone. It, it was a new version. I needed that. But it said that. That video editing software didn't need my, to know who you were. Mike, you're in here. Chris, you're in here. Most several of you are in here. They didn't need to know who you were. So guess what I... So now, but Mike, or, or I, I'll take it off Mike, I pushed that button, didn't I? So what happened then? I gave somebody else I don't know all of your contact information and hundreds, maybe thousands more. How many of you have done that? I'm, I'm not positive that I have, but I probably have, right? I bet everybody in this room who's ever downloaded an app probably has without realizing it. I'm telling you, don't do that anymore. Stop it. You failed the, the digital, you failed the digital ethics test and you didn't even know there was one. So I'm asking you a question one more time. Who's more dangerous than an algorithm or a robot? How many of you know who, the, who Pogo is? The famous possum philosopher. What is his most famous thing that he prophesied? That's exactly right. We're, we're more dangerous than any... In my book, I say... 200 years, I'm going to say 400 years, before a robot or an algorithm takes us down, we'll do it to ourselves. You and I. If we don't do something about it. So, what does digital ethics sound like? Just because I can, doesn't mean that I should. I would like, write that down, that's going to be on the test. Just because I can, doesn't mean that I should. Think about that. That's another thing that you're going to curse me for getting in your head. Just because I can, I hope it does. I hope you're mad at me for making you do that until you realize how beautiful it is. Just because I can doesn't mean that I should. And I said to that video editing software, I don't care how sexy your app is. I'm not giving you access. I'm not giving you all these people's stuff. So I don't have a video editing software in my phone. You know what? I'm actually okay now. Turns out I, did, I didn't need it like I thought I did. It would be handy, but my life goes on, and I didn't do that. I didn't give in. You can do that too. That's one little step. What is it? One small step for, man, for, for a man. <laughs> so trust was there, at the, was, was there when the markets were born, when, when civility was born. Why is it even more important today, more immutable today? Uh, my friend Archie Chankude is my, what, my trust expert in my brain trust. He wrote a book called Built on Trust. <coughs> He, he says that trust is not only the right thing to do, it's the best practice. We've known that in the analog age for 10,000 years. How are we, if it's still a best practice because, to us humans, how are we going to get that done in the digital age? We have to remember this, folks. Analog humans will always require trust. Will always require civility. Let's talk about civility for just a second. Civility is an idea, isn't it? It's just an idea. 
It's a product of the analog age. It's, it's a passive force. How's it going to do in the digital age? Is civility even possible? Have you thought about that? Is civility even possible in the, in the digital age? We have to ask ourselves that question. And if that does, if, you, if you're worried about that, as I am, maybe that'll motivate all of us to start taking some of the steps that I've mentioned. What is it, what does devotion to civility look like? We have to ask that question. I hope it looks like this. She presses that button and it goes through that beautiful catalog, digital catalog of, of digital ethics. From her office in Stanford to, to that Google farm in Mumbai to a customer in China. And on the way, it picked up all this civility and, and trust. And it came out something beautiful on the other end. We have that now. We have that in the, in the analog age. We don't have it necessarily in the digital age. So I don't have a silver bullet. I've got some ideas. Some of them are in the book. And that would be a shameless self-promotion if I hadn't given you all copies of the book. So here's a little thought to think about. These are my last slides, very last. How many of you know the book uh, Wealth of Nations? Adam Smith. Magnificent. It's the, it's the red-letter scripture of economics. And, and what is the one thing that Adam Smith, 1776, by the way, fully up, fully up, all up in the analog age, right? Horse and buggy. But he said something that there in there that he's more known for than anything else. Who knows what it is? The invisible hand. You know the invisible hand? It's the thing that, that's, it's laissez-faire. It's, it's capitalism. He said, by pursuing his own self-interest, you, you have to adjust the language just a little bit because it's, 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 you know, it's Scottish <laughs> English and, and it's hard to read his words, but this is the English, the, the modern version of it. By pursuing his own interests, as if led by an invisible hand, a person frequently promotes society more effectually than if he intended to promote it. By just going about his work, not trying to help anybody, in the marketplace, he actually helps people more than if he tried to. That's called the invisible hand, and we've been subscribing to it for forever since Og and Gog, they didn't know what it was, but they were subscribing to it. Adam Smith put it to, to paper. And, 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 and I will tell you, 20 years ago, had somebody said to me what I'm about to say to you, I, would, might, have, I might have taken a poke at them. I might have said, that that's blasphemy. But I'm afraid in the digital age, the invisible hand's day may have come. Because that presumes that you have time. That presumes that your ethics have time to catch up with your leverage. And the digital age, it doesn't. Remember what I said about this. Digital fear and greed is breaching equilibrium. We've got to find a way to, to, to push it back. And I think we're going to do it with something that I've called the visible hand. I've heard other people use this, so I'm not going to claim to be the only one to ever use it, but they use it differently. The visible hand. What is the visible hand? The visible hand is what we do, what I said earlier. We take action. We don't just, we don't just wait and assume it's going to happen. This is different. This time is different, folks. As we go about our business, we can't, we've, we've got to be more proactive about the way business is done ethically. And I think that's, what I, that's something I call the third ingredient, which is the title of the book. The third ingredient. The, the digital fear and digital greed are what I call the first and second force. The, direct, the, the, the active forces. How many of you read uh, William Least Heat Moon Trogdon's book, Blue Highways? Isn't that a beautiful, isn't that a great book? I love it. Do you remember what his Osage Indian grandfather said to him? Remember the, what the great quote? God, I love you. <laughs> what is your name? Brenda. Say that louder. Stand up. Stand up and say this. Please. You got I, I can't believe she said this. Get a picture of this. This is Brenda, ladies and gentlemen. Brenda. Yeah, yeah. Isn't this great? So, so William Lee Seat Moon was part Osage Indian. Yeah. His father was William Heat Moon. His brother was William, no, William Little, Little Moon. And he was Least Heat. William Least Heat because he was a little guy. And he wrote a book called Blue Highways. And in that book he said, There are some things that don't need to be remembered. Because they remember, the, they remember themselves. They remember themselves. Thank you. Have a seat. Isn't that great? <laughs> Good job, Brenda. Only in a library, right? <laughs> Only in a library do you get that kind of genius. <laughs> Some th think about this. Isn't that beautiful? Some things don't have to be remembered. They remember themselves. 
Fear and greed are like that. They're reptilian. They don't have to be remembered. They remember themselves. You wake up wanting to do better at work, right? You wake up worrying what somebody might, you know, pressures of the world or whatever. Fear and greed. But now those things have been digitized and we can't wait for them to breach equilibrium. Because if, if, remember that button she pushed and it went around the world? That's a lot of damage we can't put back in the bottle. We have to create something called the third ingredient. That's my word. I'm getting it started. Come up with yours. I'll, I'll subscribe to yours if you come up with a better one. Write your book and I'll, I'll tell the world about it on my show. The third ingredient is the first ingredient is fear. The second ingredient, because that was first. Second ingredient was greed. And the third ingredient we don't have yet is, 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 is that other force. It's, ne it's not passive. It will, it, we have to be devoted to it so it will remember, so it will remember itself. It will always be there. And, I, and I, I do have some ideas about what that is in the book. I'm not going to tell you right now because it takes take longer to describe, but I'll be glad to talk about it if somebody wants to talk about it. So my book, The Third Ingredient, as I said, it'd be a same, shameless self-promotion if I hadn't given you one. But in the end of that book, I, I'm, what I hope will happen as I wrap up my thoughts and, and look forward to your questions, I hope what will happen is that, is that maybe not in my lifetime, but maybe in my grandchildren's lifetime, we'll, we'll come to a point with with ethics in the digital age where we'll change the, our salutation instead of saying hello and goodbye we'll say something like zero zero and if I signed all your books zero if I haven't signed it if you want me to sign your book I will autograph it for you and I'll auto, and those are I've, I've autographed right Judy I would I say zero zero you have to read the book to find out what that is and, uh, and by the way, if I autograph your book, when you sell it on eBay, I promise you my signature will affect the price, but I can't promise you which way. <laughs> I've really enjoyed our time together. Thank you so much for, for letting me be here. Um, I'm, can, I take, can I take questions? I'd love to take all your questions. Um, if I can't answer them, my wife will be able to do that. So, Good. Questions? No smart aleck questions. Go ahead. Yes, Lester. Have you consulted any Talmudic scholars? Tom, no, I, I haven't. No, uh, they, they wouldn't allow me to consult with them. <laughs> I don't know. But why would I tell, why would, Talmudic, he said, what, have I consulted any Talmudic? I, I got to say, Lester, I never thought I'd get that question. <laughs> why, why would you want me to, to just talk to Talmudic scholars? Because this is the kind of drilling down that I believe those kind of scholars. Yeah. I, 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 no offense to them, but I, I wonder if they're, by Ruth, I wonder if they're more interested in talking about it than actually making it happen. <laughs> That's exactly my point. So who else? Yes, some, some, who over here? Yes. Isn't there a feeling that perhaps the digital ethical genie is already out of the bottle? That it's... So say what you mean. Tell me, it's too late. That, it's too late. That it's, you know, we haven't seen... What did it. I say? What did I say? Remember the slide where, the, where, the, where fear and greed breached equilibrium? Yes, that's happened. That's already happened. It's not too late. It's not too late. You know why? Because we haven't, we're still here. <laughs> as long as we're still here, it's not too late. But it's, I will tell you this, times are wasting. We can't wait. We have to tell these guys. See, we all love our young children. We all love the smart ones. I met with somebody, Peter, you've got a genius son who's, who's, uh, who's doing some great work. But these are 20s and 30-somethings who are creating your digital stuff and they're devoid of ethics, not because they're bad people doing it. They don't know about ethics like you and I do. That's happening a lot. I mean, I think it is. They, they're, they're not doing it because they're mean or bad. They just they don't think about it like we do. If they did, they'd be here tonight. Look around. <laughs> Look around. So who else? What other questions? I, I don't know. No, it's not too late. Yeah. Yes. The question I have is what were the business ethics after... The the printing press came into being when pamphleteers started printing stuff. What were the business ethics at the start of the Industrial Revolution? Suddenly then you had unions. You had corporations eventually that didn't have unions because they treated, like in Stanford, Pitney Bowes, treated the employees the right way. I mean, this, it's the march of history. So you, are, you, are you saying... Are you I'm saying, saying I don't believe in this paradigm thing because I've heard enough of that on Wall Street. 
at the beginning of the dot com yeah. boom. It's a new paradigm. Yeah, right. What happened? I mean, Whole Foods is going to delivery. Sixty years ago, my mother called up the Atlantic Fish Market to get. But uh, see, I'm not talking about. I'm not delivery. talking about progress. And and and, and the, diff the ethics comes. There's the dislocation of the change, and there's the greed is the first thing that goes. The reason I disagree with you, what's your name? My name is David. David, thank you, David. And excellent question, excellent point. I'm, I'm glad somebody pushed back. That's great. If I can't handle this, I shouldn't be here. The reason I completely disagree with you was because of what I said about the, the proximity. Look at what I can do with a push of a button. Look at how, look at what I can lever with a push of a button. What the, the ages that you talked about, whenever those levers were pulled, there was a human being standing right there, pulling the lever, probably real close to a customer who was looking back and saying, I didn't get my full measure. Today, today, today you can? See, I'm not talking about arguing among, amongst each other in the, in, in, on, on social media. I'm talking, about, I'm talking about the actual technology that's being developed, making sure that that has the kind of, that, that meets our humans' analog expectations, our, our ethical expectations. But I, I, I don't mind you feeling, I, I told you, I've already, I've already gone through this with other people. I think, David, I just think this now is different. I think this is different. And that's, that's the story I'm sticking to. Who else? Yeah, no, exactly. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Sarah. Get a, get, a, get a mic. The lovely Sarah Heiner, ladies and gentlemen. So you made a comment about the, the people today, the digital age, not having the core civility, some of the core, core ethical things. So, but they're the ones that are programming the digital products. That's what I'm, yeah. So, but at the root, the humans were in the analog age and they're in the digital, digital age. And there's a lot of discussion about the demise of civility and the demise of core ethics in humanity. So does it start at the analog teaching and cultural continuation of core ethics? You, what you're saying is, haven't we already, hasn't some of this already been leached long before the computers came? Is that what you're saying? Right, I think yeah, that, I mean, yeah. that, that well, there's, you know, there's still there's an analog analog aspect underneath the digital that that that, that, that and that's become a barren. We'd lost some of this already. Is that what you're saying? Or let's not lose it. Okay, I agree. But remember what Daniel Patrick Moynihan said in one of his books, 1970. I've forgotten the title of the book. He said defining. He said we're defining deviancy down. I, I guess I thought that's what you the way you were going because he he just meant that 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 whatever we're well it's pretty intuitive. We're defining deviancy down. Perhaps we gotten ourselves into a state where we had lost some of our civility before Facebook. <laughs> he said that. He said that. That's right. That's ex that you're making. You're making my point about the young people. Look, I believe I believe uh, millennials are the, probably the best generation we've ever raised. I think they're probably the best human beings we've ever raised. They're the most unpretentious people I've ever known. But they still drive me crazy sometimes, right? And and so so, but they're the ones that are producing. I say they. I don't mean to pick on anybody, but but they're produ producing a lot of this this stuff, and we can have influence on that. When my grandsons, I. Uh, 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 Jan talked about my, me being an obnoxious grandfather. I've got four grandsons. They don't like it when I talk to them about these things, but I do it anyway. I make them listen. Because they're going to be programming my technology one of these days. Yeah, who else? Other, other, yes, yes, sir. Mike. Mike Stoller. Oh, thanks. Um, do you know, I, I don't know the answer to this. Maybe somebody in the room does or you do. But when you look at um, transactions, retail transactions, financial transactions, any idea... Um, what percentage are done online so there isn't a face-to-face -face yeah, element it's, versus... It's, uh, it's increasing qu quite a bit. It's, it's probably approaching 40%. I don't know exactly. Yeah. Uh, 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 Chris may know that. It's not long ago, not that long ago, it was 20%. I remember a, a, a number, but that's... I say not long ago, probably maybe seven or eight years ago. It's approaching... I don't know the exact number right now, mm -hmm. but it's it's not so much how much it is; it's how fast it's growing. Mm -hmm. That's that's to me that's what's 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 going on. Well, I, you know, one one thing just this whole discussion got me thinking about years ago. I read a formula for trust that I really liked. It was um, uh, credibility plus um, reliability plus intimacy divided by perception of self-interest. 
I thought that, you know, it's good. It, it is, isn't yeah. it? I mean, there's a lot to think mm -hmm. about there. And the more we transact where we don't have that personal face to face interaction, mm -hmm. uh, intimacy declines. And I think that, and also I think, um, Perception of self-interest changes. I think so too. And the, and the thing, the thing is, folks, I, I want to point something out. My job today was to get you to think about stuff, not to walk out of here saying, "I'm going to do exactly what Blessing Game said." That's not. I, I can't get anybody to do that. <laughs> but, but uh, I want you. I just want you to think about. Have I have I said something today that you hadn't thought about before? Had I have I given you? Have I said some things to you that you said? Oh, huh, I knew that, but I'd forgotten about it. And if I said something to you, some things that you said, oh, I already knew that. All those things. That's all I wanted to do. I said that from the beginning. I just want you to think about it. But we, but I'm, I'm not, I'm not passive about what we have to do. Just because you can doesn't mean that you should. Anybody? Else? Other questions? Thank you all very much. I appreciate it. I've enjoyed it. <laughs>